Welcome to Life in the Law on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about the Supreme Court and how it overturned the Purdue Pharma settlement. Our guest for the show is David Louie, a partner of Kobayashi, Sukita, and Goda, and former Attorney General of the State of Hawaii, I might add. We're going to talk about that case, uh, how it arose, uh, what the court did recently, and what it means to the litigants, the law, and the country. Welcome to the show, David. Thank you, Jay. Pleased to be here with you. Well, let me let me just begin by asking you, um, you know, what what actually was at stake here? Um, what was the conduct that was investigated? Uh, the um, the criminal indictments that resulted, um, the uh, the settlement, if you will, that was that issue before the Supreme Court. So, so this was a decision about a civil case, not criminal about a settlement agreement in bankruptcy court by which Purdue Pharma and the Sackler family would pay approximately $6 billion to claimants, which included individual claimants, states, uh, and various other, um, I think, cities uh, in, uh, and, and agencies that had suffered losses that would provide both compensation for people, as well as future relief for future uh, opioid victims. That is, you know, uh, providing community uh, support and, and other things. I didn't, um, but it's, it's, it is a bankruptcy court settlement. And so that's, that's what this was all about. It wasn't criminal. The underlying conduct was that Purdue Pharma, uh, you know, they invented uh, opioids. Uh, basically, uh, and then they went and sold it to everybody, um, and and uh, 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 flooded the market with this stuff with fentanyl uh, that that had terrible, terrible consequences. Addiction destroyed lives. There are two hundred and fifty thousand people who died uh, since this came into being. Uh, from overdoses, and many, many more lives were ruined by addiction. Uh, families were ruined by addiction, all kinds of things. And the Sacklers themselves got involved in denying that this was a problem, in uh, marketing this stuff, um, in, in doing all kinds of things to increase their profits that they could suck money out of this drug, uh, notwithstanding all the loss of life and all of the harmed people. If you go by the movie, uh, it, was, uh, it was called um, Painkillers uh, with Matthew Broderick, very good movie, and he was very good. Um, you, you get a couple of things out of that. One is that the Sacklers knew what was going on. They knew this was habit forming. They knew the results. But they kept on pushing it, and they had all these mm, promotional activities with the doctors and the health, the healthcare providers, um, to convince them to convince their patients this was a good thing. And in the movie, and, and including some documentary movies that were made, it becomes clear that the Sacklers were uh, doing propaganda into the American market so that uh, American patients would take this stuff thinking that doctors re recommended it. And there was this whole thing about the FDA. Um, the, the FDA approved this, but the Sacklers compromised the individual at the FDA who made that approval. So it was not a legitimate approval. And, and furthermore, they were, they, they were active in Congress to protect themselves. So they were using the instrumentalities of government to uh, advance their, their plot and to protect them and uh, obstruct any attempt to investigate them. So I think one thing that needs to be said is that the Department of Justice, the FBI, worked very hard to uncover this. And the Sacklers were not particularly cooperative. And only when they were caught red-handed um, did it result in, you know, um, the litigation and, and the settlement? I guess the question I, I put to you is, was this a legitimate bankruptcy? Well, it's a legitimate bankruptcy for Purdue Pharma. And uh, it's, it, the, the issue is 
uh, whether or not the relief that the Sacklers wanted in order to put money, they withdrew $11 billion from Purdue Pharma over many years. And the question was, was Purdue Pharma didn't have enough assets to satisfy all of the claims. And Purdue Pharma filed for bankruptcy and said, well, you can have all of our assets, which is, is not a whole lot of money. And so then the question was, is as well, can the government, can the states, can the individual claimants claw money back from the Sacklers? And so they entered into negotiations with the Sacklers and said, look, we're coming after you. We're going to sue you for fraud. We're going to sue you for negligence. We're going to sue you for gross negligence. We're going to sue you for all kinds of wrongdoing um, and, and uh, intentional wrongdoing. And we're coming after you, you know, unfair and deceptive trade practices, et cetera, et cetera. And we're going to get fraud damages and punitive damages, and we're going to bankrupt you people. And the Sackler said, well, how about this? We'll give you some of our money. We'll give you, initially they said, we'll give you $4.3 billion out of the $11 billion that we took out. And who knows how much that actual $11 billion they took out is actually worth today. It could be worth $20 billion. Who knows? We don't know that. But they said, we'll put up $4.3 billion, but we want a release. We want an injunction against future suits. We want to put a stop to all litigation so you cannot come after us individually. And the bank, so that went to the bankruptcy court. The bankruptcy court said, uh, okay, but I think the, the, court, the, the court that ruled on it, the U.S. District Court said, not good enough. Go back and do it again. I'm not going to approve this. And, and then they renegotiated the deal, and the Sacklers sweetened the pot by an additional, I think, $1.6 billion to get to essentially $6 billion. So now they get the $6 billion. A bunch of the states had objected, and the states said, OK, $6 billion's enough. Um, but the U.S. bankruptcy trustee uh, from the Biden uh, administration said, that's not enough. Well, we're still going to object to this. So a bunch of the states objected, but they released those objections, and now this went up. The circuit court approved it, $6 billion, uh, but with a release of the Sacklers, who were not bankrupt themselves. National money machine that resulted in billions upon billions. So this settlement left the Sacklers as individuals, the family. By the way, he was a, a doctor. He was an MD. He knew. Yes. Um, it left them intact. It left them with pockets full of money, which were not going to be you know, included in the settlement. Correct. And that was the bargain struck because to get to the Sacklers, to get to their individual uh, assets, would be a long, hard road, which would be bringing individual claims by states. In, you'd have to have all these individual trials. And you would also have a race to the courthouse. Who gets in there first? Who gets the money first? Who gets the judgment first? Then you have to you have to claw it back. It would, it would be years and years and years of litigation. And also, you wouldn't have a global kind of a resolution for all of the victims and all of the agencies that, had, that were dealing with all of these addictions and, and, and the human cost. And so that was the bargain that was struck was, OK, we're going to let the Sacklers keep roughly half, a little bit, you know, a little bit maybe less than half, maybe more than half, I don't know of their fortunes, but we're going to get $6 billion, and that's a lot of money, and we're going to put that to good use. And that went up to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. The district court approved it. People still objected. The U.S. trustee still objected. There were individuals who still objected and said, we want to make the Sacklers pay. We want them to be penniless. We want them to be paupers. We want them punished. Um, it went up to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, and they said, you know what, this is okay. This is okay. And then it went up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court reversed. They were saying at the Second Circuit that uh, there were a lot of people out there whose lives had been taken or, you know, ruined um, by the OxyContin and the opioids, 
um, and they were waiting for a payout. And it, it had happened years before, and, and they, were, um, they were in big trouble economically. They you know, couldn't work, couldn't live. So if you look at the human side, there were, there were a lot of reasons to uh, effectuate the settlement because all these people were waiting patiently for years. No, that's absolutely true because sometimes, and that's why cases get settled, sometimes half a loaf is better than years and years of litigation and maybe a full loaf after everybody's died or after everybody has suffered for 20 years. Um, and so, and also this would allow a global settlement for everybody, okay? But the Sacklers would get uh, immunity, essentially. They would get a release. And, and so the Supreme Court decided in this case, and it's, it's a very interesting decision, because what they said was the bankruptcy court, the bankruptcy code does not specifically allow the release of non-parties to a bankruptcy. And the Sacklers did not file bankruptcy. Purdue Pharma filed bankruptcy. But Purdue Pharma, there were these claims against the Sacklers, and the Sacklers were going to put all this money back into Purdue Pharma, $6 billion, to allow the bankruptcy to go forward. And the, the U.S. Supreme Court said, you know what, there's a provision and this is where the, the, the competing factions of the Supreme Court disagreed. There's a provision, there's a catch-all provision that says the bankruptcy court can approve, quote, appropriate plans um, that, you know, are not inconsistent. Well, what does that mean? And the majority, the five to four majority of this U.S. Supreme Court held the release of the Sacklers as non-parties was not appropriate, okay? Now, the, the, um, this is a non-ideological, non-Republican Democratic decision because you have Gorsuch, Thomas Alito, Amy Coney Barrett, and then Katanji Brown Jackson, which I find really strange, but she, she joined the majority saying, this is not appropriate, okay? This does not fall within the bankruptcy code. The release of non-parties, you can't do it, okay? Um, and then on the other side, the dissent was Kavanaugh, Roberts, Sotomayor, and Kagan, who said, no, the bankruptcy uh, code allows for this. It does allow for this, and, and this is appropriate because it's going to be a global resolution. It'll take care of all these problems. Yes, it may be half a loaf, but we can do it. And the thing that Kavanaugh pointed out was this has been done for the last 20 years. It's been done. There's nothing remarkable here. And no, it, it falls in line with that whole thing about voidable preferences, where the bankruptcy court can, you know, uh, invalidate a preference uh, payment to someone. Now, there's, it's a, it's a uh, presumption in that particular part of the bankruptcy code. But if you find that this preference was for the wrong purpose, that it, it was not in good faith and so on, um, and that exactly is what happened here. Um, you can void it and return and make the money come back, claw it back, as you as you mentioned. Exactly. So I, I find that interesting. That this is the surprise to the bankruptcy bar. A absolute uh, surprise to the bankruptcy bar because the bankruptcy bar for the last twenty years has engaged in these mass tort settlements through the bankruptcy court. So Dalcon Shield, those were implants. Uh, to you know that that caused cancer in women when they had implants to prevent children, um, those were huge. That was allowed. Uh, the the um, there were um, uh, the other one uh, that occurred was the Catholic Church and the Boy Scouts. That was approved under these this bankruptcy code. And then the Dow Corning breast implants where. Oh, hundreds of thousands of women got these breast implants and then got cancer or got terrible infections and things like that. Those were improved. So for decades, this has been allowed. And now the U.S. Supreme Court said, no, we're going to change all of that. We're going to change all of that because this does not fall within the catch-all 
phrase that says it's, quote, appropriate. But, you know, uh, I, I disagree with them. Uh, and and uh, their formulation of this was Congress did not authorize the release of non-debtor parties. You have to file bankruptcy in order to get a release. So otherwise, we're just going to sue you up the yin-yang, and you can go through 20 years of, of uh, litigation, and too bad for all the plaintiffs and all of the states and all of the agencies that are willing to settle to get a half measure of justice. What motivated them to do that? Was this a, a legitimate interpretation of the word appropriate, or they, did they have some, you mentioned it's not ideological, but did they have some um, concept in mind uh, that, would, um, um, that would support this ruling of the majority? Well, their claim was is that um, it wasn't, and this is in line with, I think, the the overarching philosophy of this conservative court, although in this particular decision, you had some liberal justice, uh, Katanji Brown, who sided with them, and you had other conservative justices, Kavanaugh and Roberts, who were against this, okay? But the, the, the question is, is what are you going to allow agencies to do? What are you going to allow bankruptcy courts to do? What are you going to allow decision makers to do in a very complex world? And I think the decision was wrong. I think it was just absolutely wrong. I don't know what their motivation was. I think it's wrong because it takes away the power of discretion from the bankruptcy courts to approve large settlements. And, and the whole thing is, is we live in a really complex world. The overarching philosophy of this Supreme Court is, unless Congress specifically wrote it out and said you can do X, Y, and Z, we're not going to allow it, or we're going to let a court say, nope, can't do it, which is a terrible veto power by the courts over decisions by agencies and lower courts and things like that. Because in a complex world, and in this case, you had insurance, you have indemnification provisions. You have lots and lots of defenses that the Sacklers can use. You have the fact that they're, the money left the Sacklers, I mean, left Purdue Pharma. And in some ways, some of the people, not all of them, some of the Sackler families who were willing to part with monies were blameless, some of them. Not all of them. A whole lot of them were not blameless, but some of them were. And the discerning who was blameless who had fault, who was engaged in fraud, those are complex kinds of things. And that's why a settlement here that would take care of hundreds of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of lives and ruined lives, is a much better thing. And the Supreme Court said, no, too bad. That seems to reflect um, this, this thing that I've been entertaining in my observation of what they've done, is they don't care. They don't care about the public. They don't care how life, you know, is in these United States. They don't care what happens to people. It's, and it's not a matter of just being out of touch. It's, it's which a lot of people feel they're just simply out of touch. Um, I think it, they don't want to be in touch. They want to be out of touch. And there's a certain arrogance there, David. Do you, would you agree with that? Well, I, I think it is a theory of government that is espoused by the conservative majority, not necessarily in this case, but generally a theory of government that has been promoted by, I believe, Gorsuch, Thomas, and Alito, which is, you know what? We want small government. We want small government where agencies can't deal with complex problems. Too bad. We're just going to, unless Congress authorizes something explicitly, the government can't do anything. And, and it's this whole theory of going back to the Reagan-esque small government, that's the best way to have government. And I totally disagree with it. When you have large problems in society, like COVID, like the Dalcon Shield, like corning breast implants, like, like this one, like OxyContin, you have to have agencies, you have to have courts be able to exercise discretion and fashion complex settlements. 
Not everything falls into a neat box. You can't, you, you, it's not all round pegs and, you know, and, and round holes. Sometimes you got square pegs and round holes. And so you have to have the discretion to fashion something that makes sense. In this case, the bankruptcy code provision says it's appropriate. As long as it's appropriate, you can do it. And the bankruptcy court held a trial. I think it was a five or six week trial. They had tons of witnesses who testified. There's all these factors. And the Second Circuit Court had factors. You have to have closely related parties. And the Sacklers were closely related. You have to have claims that are factually and, and, and legally intertwined. That's what was happening. You have to have an appropriate scope of release. You have to have things that are essential to get the proper relief to people. All of those benchmarks were met by this settlement. And the Supreme Court said, eh, we don't care. One, one big problem I can see is just it's on, it's on the side of this, it's just an inch away is these cases involving mm, environmental issues, um, you know, poisons uh, that, are, that are put out into the public realm, um, contaminations and bad foods and, and all kinds of environmental issues where um, hundreds, thousands of people might be affected. And it's the same scenario again, and we can expect this to happen, as you said, in a complex society. Right, I totally agree. And in a complex society, you know, you cannot expect Congress, even in the best of times, and put aside the gridlock that exists and the ideological uh, schisms that exist. You, you cannot expect Congress to understand in advance and, and figure out how we're gonna handle every single possible problem that might come up. You have to give discretion to agencies and courts in real time to deal with the problem and to fashion an appropriate remedy. And they're not allowing that. They, you know, it's, um, I, I think it's, it's like this court overturned the Voting Rights Act, which said, oh, well, yeah, discrimination doesn't exist anymore. Well, <laughs> I, <laughs> at least, anywhere close to being true. And then, and then they're saying, well, unless the uh, EPA has specifically been authorized to do something, we're not going to let them help out and protect our environment. You got to go to Congress for authorization. I mean, that's just the most absurd theory of government that I've ever heard of. And unfortunately, that's the view of people like Thomas and Alito and Gorsuch. Well, the problem is, you know, to add on top of that, Congress is really locked up and it's not capable, you know, whether this is an ideological issue or not, Congress is really hard pressed to do anything these days, especially something complex. They could never do, uh, you know, uh, analysis at a regulatory level in the first place, um, much less, um, you know, make legislation to solve this problem. But that gets to, you know, the question of what happens now? Um, what happens to the beneficiaries? What happens to the Department of Justice? What, you know, what happens to those states? W what happens? It, it's like, uh, what happens to the courts? You mentioned you mentioned that there'd have to be litigation. My God, there's 250,000 uh, complaint complaints out there. Are they all going to sue? in the courts, it'll tie up the courts forever. And you mentioned the possibility, and this is really interesting because you know, you're a litigator, among other things. So there's a situation where the court is saying it's not enough. I don't know if it's the Supreme Court is saying that. Come back with another settlement. I don't know if they're saying that, but if that's what they're saying, it's bad negotiation. You can't say to your worthy opponent, keep coming and I'll let you know when it works. You have to go back and go through all of those steps you described again, and then when it's right, we'll let you know. Just keep working at it, which is an absurd way to solve a problem in, in the law. Right, it is absurd. And, and what they're saying is unless you declare bankruptcy yourself, you can't get a release, okay? Which is absurd because the Sacklers are never gonna put in money. They're, number one, I don't think they're bankrupt. They don't meet the definition of bankruptcy, okay? Because they have sufficient assets to cover their debts. What they have now, maybe not if there are judgments against them, 
all right? But then that's going to take years of litigation to establish. And even then, there are complexities in the law as to whether or not you can get to those assets or not. And so um, what the U.S. trustee said was, well, we think there can be an, a further negotiation. And maybe there will be a further negotiation. But with this decision, it is unclear to me that the Sacklers can, in fact, get releases, because there is always going to be somebody to um, disagree. Now, there may be a class action way they could reformulate. There are, there are legal ways to form a class action uh, and bring this, these class action claims and then get the approval of a class action judge to compromise the claims. But that will require changes in how all of these lawsuits were brought. And it will also uh, uh, require the cooperation of people who hate the Sacklers and don't care about the money, don't care about the states, don't care about future um, uh, 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 things that would help the communities. All they care about is punishing the Sacklers. There are people who are like that. And I, you know, that's not necessarily wrong. Their lives were ruined. Their families were ruined. But if all you want is punishment and retribution, I think that's a bad way to set policy. Okay. And so it's unclear what will happen. They're good. I'm sure they're all in the, the middle of uh, trying to figure out if there are legal ways to make things happen. But you know, these the Dalcon Shield case, the Catholic Church case, the breast implants case, those were settled under uh, under these bankruptcy provisions. So those cases, uh, are they at risk? No, I don't think so, uh, because the time for appeal of those has gone. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, you know, it's a problem. Cases uh, like them would be at risk uh, in the future. And so what you have is a dramatic change in the in the law, the rules, the practice around class actions in a situation like this, and uh, around the um, the law, the rules, the practice in the bankruptcy court, the bankruptcy code. Um, maybe Congress could fix it by fixing the or changing the bankruptcy code, but I wouldn't hold my breath. Matter of fact, I wouldn't hold my breath on anything. You say, well, uh, in view of this decision. Um, you know, they, they, the trustee may go back and try to negotiate a sweeter deal, what have you. That's going to take a long time. And these people who are so frustrated, uh, waiting all these years for any relief whatsoever, they're going to wait a long time again. So in terms of the fairness to quarter million people, um, there isn't. And they, they may wait like forever before there's any relief. Am I right? Um, you're not wrong. It's a real problem. Whether or not there are ways to negotiate and get something through, I don't know. There will still be people who will challenge whatever happens. So there's no, even if you got, you know, a lot of people to agree, there will still be naysayers. And uh, it's unclear whether or not that could derail something. So it's, it's very difficult. That's why you need regulatory agencies to make decisions. That's why you need government to make decisions. And so, in a way, this is a huge punt where government is not making a decision. It's just uh, letting it go to a, a kind of chaos. But let me, let me offer one other thought about this, and that is OxyContin, which is the, the opioid in question with the Sacklers, uh, the one they so wrongly promoted, um, and made all that money with is still on the market, still there. David, I can tell you, I know a person who was in pain and it was prescribed for him. And he was taking OxyContin. He was, this is recently, this is the last few weeks. And, and I'm saying, my God, uh, don't they know? Does the, doesn't the medical establishment know uh, the risks of OxyContin? It's not off the market. The FDA approval is still operative. Um, so we still have a crisis over that somehow. Um, and we still have the use of it somehow. And, you know, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know where this is going to go in terms of solving the problem. You know, I think that's, that's true, Jay. But I, I will say OxyContin and fentanyl has utility. 
Uh, I've had a couple of surgeries and I was offered OxyContin in one of the surgeries. I, I took the OxyContin um, with care and I ended up only taking it to go to sleep. But it was offered to me because it is very effective at relieving pain. Everybody has different tolerances for pain. Some people need more pain relief medication than others. Um, and, and I'm not gonna say you can't use OxyContin because sometimes it's very effective and it's a great benefit. The risk is addiction. And the risk is, you know, look at people sometimes have emotional problems. They don't just have physical problems and, and they just, you know, they become dependent upon this stuff. So you need to wean people off. Doctors need to be more careful. Those risks are, can be very terrible, but it does have utility if properly used. So I would not say it should be outlawed. I think the Sacklers did a good thing in getting OxyContin invented and marketed to some degree, but they did a bad thing in that they, they went overboard and just flooded the market to make money. And they convinced doctors to give larger and larger doses. And those larger doses is, is what made people dependent on the drug. But if you, if, um, if you have good regulation uh, where the doctor understands and is required to tell the patient, no, this is a, um, you know, a drug that you will become dependent on. So I'm only gonna, I'm only gonna give you a very limited quantity. That's, that would be a solution. And that's on the medical regulatory side of things, not necessarily the legal side. So you, again, you have to let the experts in the regulatory agencies weigh in on that. And unfortunately, we don't respect them anymore. We don't respect the science anymore. And so this is still out of control. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I don't have a solution for that. That's beyond me, Jay. Uh, you know, we just have to, we have to hope that that you have intelligent people at all levels and that we allow them the discretion to do the right thing. Uh, and hopefully they won't always do the wrong thing or they won't be tempted by the money uh, to do the wrong thing. So um, in closing, David, you know, I mean, a lot of people have lost confidence lost all confidence in the Supreme Court. You know, we could name a, a number of cases that justify that. Where does this case fit in the firmament? Is this, um, is this you know, like it used to be in terms of them applying the law to the facts? Um, or is this still mm, off the side? My own, my own view, uh, which I mentioned earlier, is they don't seem to care. Um, but what is your view about whether whether this is the kind of Supreme Court analysis that we want to have? Well, you know, so number one, uh, my view is, is that the uh, U.S. Supreme Court has been an advocate of small government, small solutions, a retreat from large solutions, a retreat from what I consider to be the essential function of government, which is to find solutions for the greatest good for the greatest number. Instead, I think this Supreme Court is ideologically uh, based with a theory that says small government is better. We want to restrict the power of the agencies. We want to allow robber barons like Elon Musk to flourish and dictate what happens to people. We want to let the rich become richer and the poor become poorer. And that's just too bad for those poor little people. Um, and I think that's a theory of government that is espoused. This particular decision does not fall easily into that framework, although I think the, 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 the end result of the decision falls into that framework. But the people who decided it include Katanji Brown, who is very liberal. Uh, and the people who were against it includes John Roberts and Brett Kavanaugh, who are pretty darn conservative. So it... Um, I'm not sure this decision uh, is a bellwether uh, for what is to come. But in general, the Supreme Court is not a friend of little people. Thank you, David Louie. We'll, we'll have to leave it there. I'm sure there'll be more we can discuss about other cases that are coming down the pipe, that have come down the pipeline and will come down the pipeline. Thank you so much, David. It's a pleasure to be here and to chat with you.
Thank you. David Louis, aloha. Aloha. 